starting the show. Uh, welcome to the Busy Guy Show. My name is Vince Locasio, and I'm a busy guy. I've got Tom Locasio. He's a busy guy, too. He's a uh, program instructor with the Bassett, which is a program for those who sell and or serve alcohol. He's also an instructor at ABC Bartending School and a magician. He's one busy guy. Tommy, hey. thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Um, I know you have a business partner, Sean Bean, who a fellow instructor we'll talk about later, but uh, what are some of the steps that brought you here to Bassett and being an instructor? Well, I started out as a teacher after I graduated college, and so then I became a dean, assistant principal, <coughs> and then um, I got involved in magic, and so I decided to give that a shot, so I opened up a bar. It's called the Magic Touch, where all the magicians did magic and stuff. And then just about the time I was selling it, uh, this is when some towns thought that it would be a good idea to have a training program to sell and serve alcohol. So a friend of mine who was the principal at one of the high schools called me because there was nothing, nobody had anything. So knowing my background, he called me and said, Tom, you know, can you help me develop some sort of program here because we've got to train and with your background, you're perfect. I said, sure, I'll be glad to help you out. So we developed a, a program and then I started doing it at uh, Harper. And then the state got involved. They wanted to have a, a program that was, you know, that all through the state, it was a program that everybody was doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So because I had the mantle of the community college, I got the grant to write the state ordinance, the state statutes, and develop the curriculum and all that kind of stuff. And then that's how I got involved with Bassett. So the short answer is, there's not a big demand for a bartender with a master's degree in education, but I was the guy. So I happened to be in the right place at the right time. Nice. So they always say a bartender is a doctor, a lawyer, teacher, no, you're right. a teacher. Referee. Um, <laughs> what is uh, Bass's, what, see if you can remember, I'm sure you got memorized, so beverage, alcohol, sellers, and server uh, educational education training. <clears throat> the reason for that acronym is that previous, these programs were always called um, alcohol awareness which always caused a problem because people go, well, why do I got to go to Alcoholics Anonymous class to sell alcohol? So the people at the state of Illinois said, okay, we don't want to call it alcohol awareness. Let's come up with an acronym. And so they came up with Bassett. So that's why it has that. But each state in the country that has a program like that has a different acronym for their training program. And uh, not to jump ahead a little bit, but what I will ask, is it mandatory in the state of Illinois? No. All the state does is mandate the curriculum that has to be taught, and then they license people to provide that training. But the state at this present moment just leaves it up to each municipality or liquor licensing agency to decide who's going to take it. Okay, and I think it should be somewhat of a, a waiver or disclaimer, whatever you want to call it, but you're by no means saying that you're a lawyer. You're just saying this: these are the laws. Right, we cover the laws because, once that. again, you know, laws get passed and people are very confused about them. So the big thing with the Bassett program is that it's designed to educate people in the bar business so that really they can act as vehicles to educate the public in areas where they don't get a lot of training or there's a lot of miscommunication or misunderstanding. Because everybody in the bar business knows that people sit around you know, the bar and they talk about this or they talk about that. And there is so much misinformation and so many you know, miscues Myths. and stuff that it would be ideal to have people professionally trained to be able to answer those questions and get this information out to the public. Okay, and you had mentioned, but uh, you've also written a book on this? Right, the book I, the book I use from my program I wrote, right. And you're uh, pretty much uh, verbiage, you wrote the law? I Correct. Mean, they asked you to use your verbiage right. to write, right. interpret the law? I got a grant to write all this up and then it was, they. DASA at the time, not the Illinois Liquor Control Commission, but DASA, the Department of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse, was in charge of this. And then they took, they told me what they wanted, I wrote it, they took it, tweaked it, and then it got sent to the state legislature where it was passed into law. Nice. Um, a, an interesting fact that you present is in the state of Illinois, uh, it takes 1,900 <coughs> credit hours to style hair. Right. 900 hours credit hours to decorate nails, and how many to serve alcohol, which is a legal drug? None. The state doesn't require any training for people who sell and serve alcohol. What they do is they set up the curriculum, but at, right at this moment, they let the towns do it. 
decide whether they want training or not. And because people are dis dispensing this drug, right. so to speak, and it's not to, you know to say that and we'll probably say more than once in the show, it's not a bad drug. It's just all in moderation and to be the right, right age and uh, not sort of alcohol is tremendously misunderstood and misused. That's the problem. Well, I mean, we all know this. This statistics are staggering from DUIs, loss of life, property. You know, there's other related uh, crimes. Mm -hmm. um, who takes this course and why? Well, with all the civil and, and criminal litigation that's attached to selling alcohol now, I mean, things have gotten tougher and tougher. Um, which, and rightly, they should they should get tougher and tougher. So each town now will decide who they are going to require to take the training. In some towns, just bartenders have to take it. In some towns, bartenders and people who work in liquor stores have to take it. In some towns, anybody who sells or serves alcohol has to do it, has to take the program. So we're talking about the big box stores. You're talking about Target, Walmart, Walgreens, all of those places. Any little liquor store, the waitresses and waiters and bartenders in, in the bars and restaurants. So once again, it, the town right now, it's called home rule in Illinois. Okay. And home rule in Illinois means Illinois passes laws, but towns and villages can pass laws stricter than state law, but they can't pass laws more lenient than state law. So this is an example of the state letting local people do what they want to do, which in Illinois is pretty much the case. There are really very, very few liquor laws in Illinois that are statewide, whereas in Indiana, as an example, the state, every, the whole state is under one set of laws. But here in Illinois, Illinois has been of the mind to let local people do what they want to do. And what about federal laws? I mean, well, federal laws, there's, once again, very, very few federal laws that come into play here. Um, a couple of them would be like, you know, the, 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 the tax stamp. The reason that we have, when a, when a liquor bottle is empty, technically it's supposed to be broken, you know, so you don't reuse it again. Those kind of fall into the federal category, but very few federal laws uh, with liquor to take here effect in Illinois. Okay, well, it's kind of obvious what some of the answers might be, but, you know, asking, mm -hmm. coming from you, uh, professional, that how are bar and uh, restaurant owners going to benefit from their employees taking this class? Well, interestingly enough, um, I just did a class at a country club, and the reason they were they taking They drink at country clubs? Occasionally, occasionally. Once in a while. Right. I know it's hard to believe. But they were taking the class not because the town required that they take it. Their insurance company required that they take it. So... A lot of insurance companies are seeing the benefit of the Bassett program and then will pass the savings on to a bar or a restaurant that actually has their people certified. So it's a big benefit there. But the other thing is, <clears throat> when we go back to, you know, like talking about, um, you have to have 1,900 hours to style hair. When you have very educated, professional people working in your establishment, it means a lot. It's going to bring back people. So, for instance, like, you know, why do we go to a hairdresser? to get our hair cut because we trust them. We know that they've been trained professionally. Mm -hmm. I mean, if all we wanted was a haircut, you know, well, then go up to your attic and find the flow bee that somebody <laughs> bought for you back in 1972 and run that through your hair. But we want somebody professional working with us. So that was another reason for the Bassett program. It makes an establishment very, very attractive to customers if they know that the people who are working there are very professional and have been professionally trained. Um, let's, well, you know, tell me about your partner first before we move on a little bit about the Well, Sean program. was um, kind of doing this program a little bit at Harper. Uh, he was with the uh, crime prevention program. He was a police officer for Hanover Park. And so then when I got started with Harper, you know, Sean and I met. And the value of having a police officer in this program is phenomenal. There are a lot of towns who actually saw the benefit of this. There are towns that you have to take, <coughs> excuse me, the Bassett training through their police department. Because here was a chance for people to actually sit down and talk with a police officer in a non-confrontational situation. And I mean, and they just get questions after questions after questions. So with Sean being involved in the program, it's like I tell my classes when Sean does his part, I go, you know, I could tell you this stuff and you could say, well, this is what this guy who was teaching the class said. Mm -hmm. But I think it's more important for you to be saying, this is what a police officer told me. And it just adds tremendous credibility to the, to the program. What a great idea, as opposed to, you know, just finally getting to talk to police officers under a bad circumstance. Right. So here you're in a forum where yeah. you can ask as many questions as you want. Right. Well, starting off, one of the, uh, you know, some of the areas that you cover, 
um, the physical properties of alcohol, drugs, and alcoholism. Right. Tell me about that. Well, <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize that alcohol is many substances. Alcohol is a phenomenal substance. It's a preservative. It's an anesthetic. Is that why you look so young? Yeah. <laughs> it's an anesthesia. <laughs> it's a preservative on the outside, not on the inside. Um, so it's an anesthesia. It's a solvent. I mean, it's a lot of different things. It's a phenomenal substance. So we talk about alcohol at the beginning of the class just in a very, very basic way so that we can get on to the other things and eliminate some of the myths and misconceptions that people have. So, like we know that al people know that alcohol kills, but very few people know how it kills you. And it kills through the an by its anesthesia properties. The difference between the anesthesia ether, which to be an anesthesiologist, you've got to go to four, you know, 14 years of medical school, and alcohol is oh, just a simple... Oh, this is a long as a Yeah, is a simple molecule of water. The difference between ether and alcohol is a simple molecule of water. That's it. So when someone dies of alcohol poisoning, the actual cause of death on the death certificate is asphyxiation. You suffocate. Really? Because the anesthesia properties build up in your bloodstream and then eventually will put to sleep that part of your brain that keeps your heart beating and your lungs breathing. Well, the first one to go is what keeps your heart... I'm sorry, your lungs breathing. So that stops and then the part that keeps your heart beating stops. So you die first of asphyxiation and then heart failure. But that's how alcohol kills people, the same as any anesthesia would. So they begin to understand that. And then that gets into, you know, a lot of myths and misconceptions. People still, still think that alcohol keeps you warm in colder weather uh, for a lot of different reasons. But it's actually the anesthesia properties that it does. Because whenever they're playing football, when it's 40 degrees below zero, you know, the cameras always find two or three guys naked in the stands, yeah. you know, having a good time. And people think, well, the alcohol is acting as an antifreeze. Well, it's not. They have consumed enough of an anesthesia to put to sleep that part of the brain that handles pain. Because if you think about the things we say when we talk about alcohol, we go, I was feeling no pain. It's because you weren't. You were under anesthesia. You know, in every Western movie, what do they give a guy before they pull an arrow out of him or dig a bullet out? It's for the, at, at one time, alcohol was one of the few anesthesias that people had. So those guys up in the stands, are numb. They, you know, they don't feel the They're pain. Not they don't feel anything. So they won't feel the pain until you know they wake up the next morning. So it's actually it has nothing to do with keeping you warmer. It actually, the worst thing you can do when it's cold because it draws heat to the surface and dissipates it. Because the other thing people believe is that well, when I take a drink, I feel warm. You know, you mm -hmm. get that flush. Well, the problem is alcohol thins the blood. So when your blood thins, the body reacts by increasing your heart rate and opening up your capillaries to let more blood cells come through. This is a science program. Well, once but you again, obviously though, are an expert in right. it. This is great. So you can understand then that if we can piss, pass this on to these people mm -hmm. that are in the business, and when they can start talking like this over the bar, you can imagine the respect that the customers are going to have for them. And really, when it actually comes down to it, when it comes down to that critical time, you want that customer to believe you and trust you when you tell them, I don't think you should be driving. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. It's kind of moving ahead a little bit, but while you're on that kind of scientific thing, um, what about sobering up? You know, like people have the misconception, oh, I'm going to drink plenty of coffee, and I know okay. what's the response There to is, you can do a lot of things to make yourself feel better. People have hangover cures, they mm -hmm. call them. But there is nothing you can do to accelerate the elimination rate of alcohol because it's done by your liver, which is an involuntary muscle system, and your liver is only going to eliminate alcohol at the rate of one-third to three-quarters of an ounce an hour. You can't accelerate nor deaccelerate that process. So even though you may feel better, mm -hmm. if you were to blow in an intoxilizer, you would be the same as whether you took the hangover cure or not. So time is the only thing. Time is the only thing. Okay, let's move on to a big subject, uh, which covers quite a few points, and that is minors. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, uh, I don't want you to go in detail about the sale to minors, you know. What can you tell me about that? Well, the obvious thing to point out is that there are a lot of laws that deal with liquor at the municipal level. You know, you can do this, you can't do that, everything. There is only one item that every town is preemptive on. All the other things, you know, gambling, whatever, you've got to bring attention to yourself before the police would get involved, before the town would get involved with your liquor license. The only one that they're preemptive on, the only one they do sting operations on, is minors. 
That's the one they're preemptive. No town wants a reputation of minors being able to get alcohol in their town. So they're very preemptive about it. And I've talked to different towns, different police officers. And some towns, if you get caught in a sting operation, you are put in handcuffs right then and there, taken out of the restaurant or bar, police station, fingerprinted, and you're charged wow. with a criminal offense. They don't fool around with that. I think um, it, it might sound silly to say, but I think the most person that should be most educated about it is the minors. I don't think they realize that they're going to get as, in as much trouble for things like um, fake IDs. Well, once again, minors, by the very fact that we call them minors, <laughs> they're just, they're invincible. They, they don't believe, you know, stuff can happen to them. And we've seen the tragedies that have happened with these, you know, these mm -hmm. children that have, you know, died in car crashes or at somebody's home, drowned in a swimming pool or things like that. They think they're invincible. But there are severe monetary fines for minors who are caught with fake IDs. The Secretary of State, if, you get, if a minor is caught with a fake ID, maximum penalty is revocation of your driver's license for life. For life. For yeah. life. What about little Susie that's 22, or she's not little, but she's 22, and her sister looks just like her, and she's 19, and she says, you know what, here, just use my ID tonight. Who gets in trouble? Everybody does. It is a felony in the state of Illinois to provide someone with fake identification. So Susie says, when Susie says, here, use my ID, mm -hmm. she's now committed a felony, which is punishable by years in prison. But also the Secretary of State will also, could also revoke her license for life as well. Okay. And like I said, you, uh, you're not a lawyer, but tell me about um, a case where maybe parents can be liable for letting, let's say, you know, I know my kids are underage, but we're going to have the party there. Somebody drinks, goes out and hurt somebody, kill somebody, whatever. Who's, okay. Are they Very much part so. of the liability? <clears throat> In fact, January 1st, um, our state legislature and Governor Quinn signed into law much different penalties for that kind of a situation. Um, the, the problem is, is that minors can consume alcohol under two circumstances in the state of Illinois. One is in their own home with their parents present. Now, that doesn't mean friends can drink if the parents are there. Mm -hmm. It's in your own home with your parents present or at a bona fide religious ceremony. And the law is really long in explaining a bona fide religious ceremony. I mean, taking a six-pack out to a park to talk to God, <laughs> not, that's not a bona fide. Not yeah, that's not going to cover it. Okay. So the, the situation is we had those parents in Deerfield who had a party for their kids, and somebody died. Those parents went to jail. They actually went to jail. So it's usually magnitude and attitude that's going to involve the state's attorney to get involved in it. But trust me, if, if, if kids die, I guarantee you somebody's going to go to jail. Mm -hmm. Now, previously, it was more of, okay, the kids were at the party, and the parents say, well, we knew, but we'd rather have them drink at home then go out and drink, so we're going to do it at home. Now, the law is very specific. If minors are caught drinking in someone's home, the parents have a huge burden of proof to show that they did not know. If there's any evidence that those parents knew that that party was going on and there was alcohol at that party, there are tremendous fines that are now applicable by law that the state's attorney can impose on them. Um, something that's on your website and it listed as part of the class, uh, if you want to tell me about victims' rights. Right. Well, here was another subject where a lot of people have no idea when we talk about this in class. Um, just, I mean, I asked the question, okay, a drunk driver hits you, he's charged with reckless assault. Is he entitled to an attorney if he can't afford one? Yeah. Can he take the fifth? Yeah. Are you entitled to an attorney if you can't afford one? Everybody goes, yes. I go, no, you're not. The United States Constitution grants no rights to victims. Victims have no rights at all, none. Only the accused They're does. taken away. No, they never had them to begin with. Okay. Because the crime against any individual is a crime against all. So in a drunk driving incident, the drunk is the defendant. The state's attorney is the plaintiff. The state's attorney represents the state, not the victim. You know, there's several you know, examples I can give you, but not too long ago, there was a guy that was running down the beach in Chicago and got attacked by pit bulls. Mm -hmm. He's laying in a hospital with his arm ripped off, and the state's attorney goes, well, we don't think there was a crime here. Nothing happened. So they get 
you know, so that sits everybody back. But the, the example I give is that the story I was told, and, and know to be true, this girl was hit by a drunk driver. Her car overturned, gasoline leaked, it ignited. She was trapped in a burning car. She was horribly disfigured. By the time the trial came around, she was strong enough to leave the hospital, but she wasn't strong enough to go through any plastic surgery yet. The attorney for the drunk got a court order to take pictures of her. That young lady had to go to a photographer's studio, and with the drunk's lawyer present, had to disrobe completely and pose for any pictures that he wanted taken of her. And there was nothing she could do about it. Why did he want those pictures? So that he could take them to the court, show them to the judge, and get the reaction he wanted, which is aversion. You can't look at pictures like that. Yeah. His argument being, her condition is of no evidentiary value as to what caused the crash. My client is charged with this crime. The state's attorney has to prove he caused it. Her presence in the courtroom or these pictures will do nothing but prejudice the jury against my client. He can't get a fair trial. The judge agreed. The girl and the pictures were barred from the courtroom. So your point is victims. I mean, the victim rights. Victims' rights. But also, here's the other thing about the victims' rights, which, I'm very, which I talk about a lot in class. We do have victims' rights in Illinois. There are victims' rights that you only have here in Illinois. But what people don't understand is, and I believe the media does this, but groups like MAD, AIM, RID, SAD, all of these organizations are portrayed as prohibitionists uh -huh. in nature. And they're not. They're victim advocacy groups. The reason we have victims' rights here in Illinois is because of those groups. There's been big changes in the dram shop laws thanks to those kinds of groups. Because I had a girl in my class that was, she lived in Michigan. Now, this is an example of rights right, between I may, states. Let's sure. move along, please, because okay. there's a lot more for you to cover. Uh, no problem. Just cover, uh, on happy hour laws, what are the, what they used <clears throat> to be able to get, get away with and what are the no Okay. Well, you could get away, get away with that. anything before the happy hour laws. When I was, you know, when I was bartending, it was like happy hour between three and six, which meant two for one. So when I gave last call for happy hour, at 5.30, people would order two drinks, four drinks. Well, now they got eight drinks in front of them. Okay. So the worst time to be on the street was not 4 o'clock in the morning. It was 7 o'clock at night. So this was an example of home rule. Lombard was the first city to pass no happy hour, no two for one. Then other towns started passing it. And so then all this, because all these states, had, all these different cities had passed it, the state jumps in and says, okay, no happy hour. And basically, in a nutshell, the happy hour law says that you should not entice customers to drink more than they normally would have. That's the, that's okay, the, and or no drinking contest. Like right, because now you're enticing them to drink more than they normally would. Okay. So like with the, um, one, and once again, like when a law is passed, that's one of the jobs of the attorney general is to decide what the law really means. So that's why people got confused. Well, then can I serve a, can I serve a shot in a beer? Can I serve a boiler maker? Attorney General said yes, because I'm ruling that by usual and social custom, it is one drink. One drink. It's got one name. It's ordered as one drink. I mean, you know, you got half the rail at a Long Island iced yeah. tea, and you're worried about giving this guy a shot in a oh, beer. Boy. What about the, what? What uh, I know there's ways around it now. Somebody buys a, a bottle of wine and doesn't finish it at the restaurant. Right. Well, here's uh, now, here's an example work? of our state legislature actually doing something right. When the Happy Law first came out, it said you can't take one. You know. You can't leave with wine because you don't have a license for that. So here you've got a, a couple who, or even a single person, because you can sell a bottle of wine to one person if, if they have a meal. So now they're enjoying the meal, they're enjoying the bottle of wine, but they don't want to finish it. Well, now they can't take it with them. And they spend a decent amount of money on the right. wine. Right. So now you're forcing them to drink more than they normally would have, so change the law. So they did, so that's why now in restaurants and stuff, if you don't finish your bottle of wine, they just have to put it in an unbreakable sealed package, and you can take it with you, but keep it in the trunk until you get home. And prove that they had food as well. I believe that's... They may have to, yeah. Go to the website and we'll find out. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's just, if, if anything comes out of this show or out of all the bastards, if one life is saved, it's, uh, you know, it's a great thing. Um, you got, we got about a minute, and it's such a big subject, but the point oh eight alcohol... 0.08. 0.08. Right. Okay. This is what this is very confusing to people. 0.08 is the illegal limit to drive in Illinois. People say, "Well, it's 0.08 is the legal limit." It's not. At 0.08, you are legally 
intoxicated. Previous to that, you were legally intoxicated at 0.10. So the legal limit of intoxication is left to the states. In Illinois, it's 0.08. It is in all 50 states anyway, because they changed that, but that's another long story. So it's 0.08. But our laws are DUI, driving under the influence. You can be arrested in this state for a DUI with very little alcohol in your bloodstream. You don't need to be at 0.08. But once again, I don't want to scare people thinking that one drink they're going to get arrested. Mm -hmm. The thing you have to understand is, is that the average, I believe the average DUI, I haven't seen this year's statistics, but I believe the average DUI of an arrested drunk driver is 0.12. So they're one and a half times the legal limit, or the illegal limit of intoxication. So basically, just remember, the police officers are out there. They're not looking to bust somebody who just had one drink. They're, they're looking, looking to save lives. They're I mean, looking for people who are obviously to. dangerous, you know where they could obviously see this driving behavior. Okay, I think um, I, we, we kind of did run out of time, but I think you covered a lot of good points. Uh, okay. If anybody has more questions, it's Bassett of Illinois right. .com. right. And Or they uh, can call you and have me back. Yeah, <laughs> send emails. <laughs> or as Soupy Sales said, send money. <coughs> um, I know the, the alcohol companies are on the bandwagon, you know, and they're putting Very much so, very much so. Um, but trick it, I mean, it's like anything. So in moderation, trust a bartender if he tells you no, that you've had too much. Exactly. Because they're not, uh, if anything, they want to pour your drink. But, but you're going to trust somebody who in the past has shown you that he's a professional. Once again, that's the key to Bassett. Okay. And once again, it's not mandatory, but it's certainly going to help a hell of a lot of people. Exactly. Um, I think the people that you teach, especially with your experience, are very, very... Uh, lucky to have you because you know well i tell it i, I tell it like it is you got experience yeah i don't know. teach fairy tales that kind of thing i it okay. just i can't do it all right well listen i forgot um i got a meeting to go to so i wanted to thank you for being on the show and my i never oh. get my scheduling right but here's some cannoli for you hey thanks very much um so oh boy i'm probably late for it all right hello cannolis Hey, you said 7.45. I got, hold on. I got more people who want to be on the show. <laughs> you think you're the only busy guy? I got to go. All right, okay. listen. I'm sorry. I will be there shortly. Okay, bye. All right. Sorry I had to do that. I hate doing that. No problem. Um, Appreciate the Drink responsibly. Have fun, right? Exactly. And listen to the bartender. And the other people are serving you. Bye. Busy guy. Yeah. All right. Take care. All right. Sorry I got to leave. No problem.